So good morning, good morning. you guys, girls. Good to see everybody this morning. Um, we are back on COVID watch again, like we were 18 months ago, kind of almost day by day now. Uh, it's, it's in our area, um, going tearing through our area actually. And, um, you know, I, I want you to um, understand that we've taken it seriously from the start and we're gonna continue taking it seriously. Uh, I'm concerned that there's so much confusion because of all of the uh, disputes about it, all of the arguments about it, all of the changes that have happened, you know. Uh, health officials are just trying to keep up with a, with a changing disease. And, and uh, so, so right now, if, you, if you've been exposed to COVID, I think the current guidelines are get tested five days later. And if you have a negative test and you've been vaccinated, you're, you're good after, after a negative test after five days of exposure, okay? So we'll take that here as your clearance card or whatever. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated and you're exposed, you're supposed to isolate. And that isolation period is under, under debate. It's seven to 10 days. Uh, but you got to take that on yourself. If you have a positive test for COVID, you've got to quarantine for, for uh, 10 days to 14 days. I forget what it is. And then you have to have a negative test afterward. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've been keeping up with this, but it changed a little bit, but, but just so there's no confusion. And, and uh, we're hanging on by a thread as far as being able to meet because we're meeting outside. And, uh, you know, and that, that's got the air moving and, you know, uh, so the idea of us, hey, let's find a place to all pack in together uh, while the pandemic rages outside, uh, it's just not, I hope you understand, it's not even on the forecast. About a year ago, um, a man who I really respect a lot said, if you're going to be uh, continuing on with Zoe after COVID, you've got a plan now for it. And... Uh, I just, just, I dismiss that. That's just not, not uh, respective of what's happening. And, and just so there's no confusion, there is a horse loose uh, with the wrath of God on earth. And part of that is, is fa uh, pestilence. Part of that is disease. Uh, it is the fourth horse, the pale green horse uh, by name, death. And, um, I don't think this is just a uh, biological phenomenon that happens. Uh, I think the wrath of God is loosed in some of this. And, and, it, and, and I only say that because we got to take it seriously. God is preserving us. Uh, we, we've, you know, we've, got, uh, we've got mitigation and we've got, uh, we've got treatment now. We've got a vaccine. You know, we've got things that are the grace of God. And so we're not in terror. We're not locked in our homes uh, trying to keep the air out. Uh, but uh, you got to understand some, this is really serious. And so uh, planning, planning uh, that it's over and what we're going to do next is just not the way to approach this at the moment. So we're not doing that. <laughs> so we're grateful to meet today. This is the day the Lord has made and we're meeting today and we're able to be uh, outside, outdoors, have the air flowing through and, and uh, things are fine. Uh, we have we have some who are who are stricken with COVID right now, and we're praying for them. And uh, we we uh, just want it to turn out to be one of those mild cases, and uh, not not one of the abnormalities. And so anyway, uh, pardon me for the lecture, but um, I know that there is COVID fatigue. People are tired of hearing of it, and uh, don't want to hear about it anymore. And uh, you know, I don't want to get under the hoof of a green horse. <laughs> I'd rather just let's be careful and let's just do this right and uh, let the let the Lord's grace protect us in the ways that he's sent to protect us. So enough of that. Thank you for letting me say that and go through that. Um, and and uh, we, we still are praying for each other and praying for our community that uh, this will pass through, that when the school, and I know that you guys who have kids in school, you're dealing with this, you're dealing with all kinds of issues right now that are making the head twirl. So um, just know that we're trying to watch out for you in terms of our meeting goes. Uh, we may have to suspend, we may have to uh, zoom into your home instead of uh, whatever. 
but that those decisions will be made with everybody's best um, interest in, in mind, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and if you and you know if you do have exposure or whatever, if you do the right thing, we're going to be okay. And uh, and then you can let uh, Dave or or Jess or myself or Lisa or Kathy know, and uh, and we'll um, we'll do the best we can to kind of factor it all in. So, with all that said, uh, uh, speaking of Kathy, I'm going to ask her to come up and open us with a prayer. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Lord, I don't know how many times I've said this is an opportunity, but I believe it with my whole heart that prayer is such an opportunity that we have this this time right now to be able to come before you not only to open the service but to give you our lives such as we are lord everything we are good bad uh, indifferent um, i just pray that you would be with us right now and help us i thank you for your holy spirit and 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 the power that that you have given us through him to be able to walk with you today, Lord. So we want to give you our lives right now. I thank you for your unfailing love. I thank you for how specific it is, how specific you are, how much you see us right now, that you know us inside and out. You know all of our ways, all of our hopes and dreams all of our um, discouragement and letdowns and i'm just thinking about faith hope and love and the fact that the greatest of these is love but that faith and hope are going to remain also faith and hope are going to get us to see you face to face lord and i just pray for our faith that little mustard seed today that you would stir it up and put it in the right place let your grace be sufficient for us in the specific way that you have for each of us, Lord. But I pray also, Lord, that you would give us hope. I pray that where the enemy has, has discouraged us or spoken to us and uh, made us believe things that aren't true, that your word would be in that place mm -hmm. and that we would have a hope for the future, for a life with you. And I just thank you that your word says in the old king james hope maketh not ashamed and lord i for one don't want to be ashamed mm -hmm. there's enough uh, that going around and i i don't want to um, i don't want to try to conjure anything i just want us to be here and yielded before you and know that you are enough for us so we give you today in jesus name amen amen, amen. thank you kathy all right, so I'm going to read verses uh, 14, I'm sorry, verse 12 through 15. So follow along with me. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Let's uh, pray one more time. Oh, Father, please help us to get uh, the vision of this passage of Scripture I pray it would not be like a postscript to us, but it would be raw data, raw data of how you desire to work in us as a community of faith. And I pray that those who can take on the responsibilities of this passage will, and that for all of us, we could find within us operating some of the basic raw power of the Spirit of God in a community of faith. We give you this morning and ask for your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 2003, I helped lead a group of 15 believers on a short-term mission trip to the central Philippines. And it included an overnight journey to northern Mindanao to a Bajau settlement in Cagayan de Oro. At the end of a full day of ministry, I stood with a local 
San Clemente businessmen as we uh, surveyed the poverty and the overwhelming uh, nature of, of the uh, village. And he mused out loud, what are we supposed to do? How are we ever going to be the same? How can we walk away from this knowing this is here? And, and he said, we can't just do nothing. And I think that kind of is the whole point of short-term missions trips. Uh, I was trained for missions trip by two really capable, uh, uh, I don't know, I want to call them older brothers in the Lord, uh, Jim Davis from uh, uh, the South County past Pastoral <coughs> Missions to Asia, uh, and his uh one of his protégés, Glenn Totten. And the first time I went, uh, three years before the, the moment I told you about, um, there was thorough training, what to expect, what not to expect. And <clears throat> one of the resources I was led to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> gotta get this uh, old vocal stuff going here. So one of the um, <clears throat> people that helped me prepare um, warned me of something and they said you know when you when you go out in the missions field and you see the hand of God and the work of God you're going to start seeing a lot of things really clearly and when you come back you're going to be a fire breathing dragon you're going to see all the imperfections you're going to just know this is why we have all these problems because we're not taking this seriously and, and we're not taking God seriously and you're going to have a number of solutions that you try to push on others and and so the advice was just um you know, just just ignore that. Uh, take a two-week decompress period or longer if needed. Just don't make any important decisions in your life and don't yell at anybody or tell anybody what they should be doing. <laughs> just kind of come to grips with the fact that you went, God blessed it, it was, it was uh, it, you served, you came back home, and now nothing's going to change until Jesus comes. <laughs> it's going to be the same world that's filled with stuff but you may have touched people and helped people along the way by going there and encourage them, but uh, just come to grips with this whole process. So, um, so when we came back from this uh, trip, I didn't have any problem with myself, but I had problems with all 15 people who came back. They were all fire-breathing dragons, and I, and I realized the task of trying to uh, tame 15 fire-breathing dragons and get them excited again about Southern California mega church ministry, which was not, wasn't so easy. Um, so this morning, we're going to see some things that Paul wants in a community of faith. And you're going to realize they're not there. They're not there in the places you've been or, or whatever. And you're going to uh, maybe understand why see some things of, well, this is why and that's why. And you're going to want to say something, do something. Uh, your expectations are going to be uh, uh, raised up. And uh, I want you to forget about that this morning. I want you to just take this as it is, not take this as an ideal, uh, because for Paul, the Thessalonian church, it wasn't so much an ideal. It was Here's where you go next, okay? You guys believe the gospel. The gospel has saved you. You're chosen now. Things are happening. The right things are happening because of the gospel. Here's the corner you need to turn now. Uh, here's where you go next. And so um, what we want to be on the lookout for are ways in which we can legitimately serve the Lord in the community of faith. And, uh, and, and if, you've, if you see things that you can do and, and uh, take responsibility for, then, um, then those are the things that God's calling you today. Uh, the Holy Spirit's responsible for the activities in the, in the overall community of faith, and He will uh, get His way one way or another. And um, so we're going to rest assured in that. So let me just uh, make one little adjustment here. Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. Ah, the camera stuff. Yeah, okay. So, we start out in verse, verse uh, 12 and 13. Again, we find Paul using the term uh, brothers and sisters. 
And this is significant. It's significant that after all of this five chapters of stuff, he doesn't say the apostles. We the apostles. We, we are tell, we're going to tell you something. It's brothers and sisters. And remember, uh, he, he um, is on their level. And this is further enhanced by uh, the first verb in verse 12, which is untranslated for some reason in your New Living Translation. But he literally says, we are asking you. Brothers and sisters, we are asking you. Now, remember the, remember the different phrases we've seen Paul use in 1 Thessalonians. I call you, which is another brother and sister um, uh, method. He's also commanded them at times with things, uh, but uh, commanded them to, to love and, and to brotherly love. But here we're asking you, and the particular verb for ask, eratao, is, is to ask on an equal to equal level. There is a petitioning asking of someone would ask of someone else uh, a superior. They would ask him Iteo, and and that would that would mean you you respectfully and humbly ask someone of superior power and and uh, status to to answer your prayer. That's the way we pray to God. By the way, we we don't pray on a you know we don't we we go boldly before the throne. Okay, but that doesn't mean we charge into Jesus' presence and go, hey, hey, bro, you know, <laughs> hey, would you do this for us? I think this is really needed right now. What do you think? You know, that's like, that's like so disrespectful, it's laughable. Uh, but we, we ask God from a position of, of being on the ground face down in our soul and our spirit figuratively, and especially when we have a, a, a request that's really heartbreaking to us, uh, a, a loved one or a, or a particular place we're at, which is really hard and dark. Uh, we beg God for help. We, we ask him from that position. So Paul is asking the Thessalonians from an equal to equal. Uh, and, and he's saying, uh, hey, Paul, uh, Timothy and Silas, we three, uh, we've, we're touring the world with the gospel. We're bringing the gospel to different places and it's come to you. Now we're going to ask you as people who brought you the gospel, who have the gospel in us, we're going to ask you on that peer-to-peer level. We're going to ask you something. And by the way, this, this verse, which is, which is verse uh, 12 and 13, has a, it has an ask and it has an insistence. After the ask, he insists something uh, uh, by an imperative, and that, that insistence follows from the ask. So he's going to say, I want to ask you guys something, and when I'm all done asking, and, and if you want to do it, then you are going to be able to make peace and keep peace with one another this way. Because what I'm about to ask of you is the key to having peace with each other. So you might note at the end of verse 13, uh, it, it says, uh, keep the peace among one another. So, so that's where we're going with verse 12 and 13. This is uh, an ask of uh, the community of faith, uh, faith at Thessalonica. So the ask is to know the leader's true character okay now this is this has got to be unpacked here um to know the leader's true character and to value it super abundantly in love because of their work that's the full thing that we're going to be unpacking here for the next few minutes okay so so first of all um it's it's leaders and not rulers okay and you know there's a difference okay uh, Kathy and I, in selecting our breed of dog, well, we have this preferred breed, the Australian Shepherd, and it's because they have a reasonable amount of intelligence. Not that your dog is not, is not smarter, but um, but you know, for example, at eight weeks, uh, the the dog through crate training or whatever learned to ring a bell when he had to go outside. Now, I particularly like that since my duty oftentimes is the cleanup uh, on aisle five or whatever that is, aisle hallway. So the fact that the dog would go to and ring a bell of, I got to go potty, and then go outside and go, that's a marvelous dog right there, okay? So, uh, but along with this, this sort of uh, thinking is, you get this downside. The downside is the dog learns that if he, wa- if he wants to see a butterfly out in the backyard, he just rings the bell, and we put him out, you know? So before long, you're just like, you're just like opening and closing the door when he rings the bell because, you know, and you know how that goes. So, so, um, uh, so the thing about uh, our dog is that he doesn't always follow. He, he doesn't always follow. And, 
And, you know, he's a great traveling dog. He, he, he travels better than Kathy and I travel. But, um, but he doesn't always follow, and this can be problematic, okay? So, so sometimes in other states, uh, I, I try to find a Costco gas station. And in and, and the early days when we were traveling up to Washington, uh, we, we would use the opportunity while waiting in line to take him uh, to, you know, put him on a leash and, and he'd jump out of the van. We'd, we'd go off to the side grass area and he'd do his business and come back, okay? But he doesn't want to get back in the van. And so I can't tell you how embarrassing it is to be sitting in a, in a Costco gas line and your dog is laying on the ground going, I'm not moving, I'm not getting back in that car again. And, and uh, no matter what you do, you plead, you threaten, you whatever, he's not going in there. And <laughs> so, um, but you get the feeling that leading is about going ahead and doing something and, and asking people or, or animals to follow you that way. It's not ruling them, it's not demanding, it's not commanding them. It's going first and having them follow. And so in any community of faith, there are people who are leaders, leaders, not rulers. Now, unfortunately, we are in an era where there is a lot of backlash against rulers. Um, and it is, it is a problem. Um, it is a problem in oh so many ways. Um, it's a millennial generation problem, and let me tell you why I think that. There are a lot of expectations about uh, leaders in the church created by the fact that millennials are, the, are a generation after the evangelical baby boomers. Many uh, millennials grew up in churches that, that held evangelical power structures, and the millennials feels like they understand what a pastor should be. What a pastor should be a ruler. And a pastor should be all of the things that pastors aren't really called to be, but they pretended to be in, in another era. And so you'll have people I, uh, uh, feel very comfortable in the church, but then they'll realize, oh, I got this one problem. I expect my pastor to be there for me. And, uh, you know, and, and so there's expectations of, of, of things in which they expect. And when those expectations aren't met, uh, there's a lot of a lot of wrath, a lot of anger, a lot of disappointment, a lot of reaction, a lot of trouble follows after that. And so, whatever the expectations are, um, you you may or may not be able to meet them. But what we're going to cover in this verse are the expectations that are binding from the Lord. These are the expectations that millennials should have about leaders. These are the expectations that all people should have about leaders. Nothing more and nothing less. Uh, I've been I've been hesitating on on commenting anything from the uh, uh, the rise and fall of M Mars Hill from Christianity Today because some of you are still getting around to listening to it and tracking through it's very important uh, podcast put on by Christianity Today uh, tracking the rise and fall of Mars Hill Church led by Mark Driscoll through uh, the, the 2000 early aughts and into all the way up to 2014 when it completely collapsed and was disbanded uh, at that point. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. There's a lot of examples. Uh, you know, we used to say in studying uh, the way that the next generation was coming up that, that they learn by example. They need examples. They need incarnational things. Uh, well, there's such a negative example with Mar Mars Hill and Mark Driscoll that you need to know that that lesson is out there. And perhaps uh, it was allowed to be an example in that way. But there's this place at the end of, of uh, the, the recounting of the stories where Mark Driscoll has taken his entire crew to travel to uh, uh, Turkey. Uh, which in the scripture, you know, Anatolia and, and the, the churches of the book of Revelation were there in that area. And, uh, and so they're going to film Mark Driscoll teaching uh, uh, in, that, in that area. He's going to teach the book of Revelation. And, uh, and it's a really sad, um, uh, sad uh, commentary. But the people in the filming crew who were, who were leaders in the church uh, that he was at, they they realized on the way to go filming that 
uh, Mark Driscoll was staying in this posh place and that they were staying with the Anatolians. Oh, I guess they're, they're called uh, Turkish poor <laughs> poverty village. And, and, they, and they realized something was wrong. And so when he started teaching out of, out of uh, Revelation chapter two, and he taught about uh, the, the, um, uh, the church to Ephesus, and Jesus said, uh, you, you, have, you have left your first love. They all looked at each other and realized they had left their first love. They had followed Mark Driscoll and they had left Jesus. And it's a chilling moment uh, to be on the other side of the world for them and to realize that they were in a personality cult and not, uh, not doing the work of God in that grand fashion. Okay, So we here are almost the opposite, totally opposite set. Okay, We are not in Anatolia at the site of the original Ephesus. We are in Dave's backyard here this morning. And we can get this point. We can get this. Uh, we can get the uh, meaning of this because, uh, because they're not, there's not the distractions in the way. There's not the problems in the way. So... Um, also, what's, what's told to us uh, is, is that we are to know the leader's true character. Leaders, plural, but their true character. This comes from the Greek word oida, which is the word for know, but because you've seen it, because you, you know it. And the implication here is that uh, you, you see in the leaders the validity of what they're doing serving the Lord. You don't hold them on a pedestal like, well, that person is a, is a person of authority. I don't want to buck authority here. But you don't minimize the fact that they, that they serve the Lord and, and that they are trying to lead. You, you can't, you got to be in the middle ground there. You can't minimize it and you can't overrate it or you'll fall into trouble. So the way you do that is you realize that person's got strengths. That person really is dedicated to serving the Lord, and they're not hitting all the buttons. For example, uh, when I sit down with them in counsel, uh, they seem more of just wanting to pray for my problems than they have cures. They can't cure me. They don't fix me. But boy, when they lead in worship, I can just dive right in because they got that strength. They got that They've got that, and I watch it over the years. I see it over time, and I have confidence in that. And, and you, you have to come to know the true character of the person who's the leader, okay? And this is, you know, this is easier said than done. Uh, I realize that as I'm teaching, you're looking into my soul, because I'm looking into your soul, and it's not fair that I only see you and you don't see me. I know you see me. And you have to look and you have to see and you have to understand that that I'm trying to uh, lead us in Scripture this morning in a way that benefits us all. I'm trying to open up the Scriptures in a way that that not just a shallowness, you know, we're not taking this in three word bites, you know. Uh, pick up the shovel, put the shovel in the ground, push the shovel down, dig and flip, and then go on your merry way. We're looking at it and unraveling it in a, in a way that requires you to think a lot. It requires you to work through things, to, to come up against the things you've heard before and realize, well, maybe the things I've heard before, uh, I need to just let them give way right now and, and learn something new about this. And, uh, and, and so knowing the true character of, of the group's leaders. And, you know, we, you know, we have this advantage of, of being a small church and, and in a small church, uh, you know, most of the people that hang in there are, you know, they have a good maturity level. They're pretty, pretty mature in the Lord and pretty well grounded in the word. And, and, uh, you know, we've been through, we've been through the early COVID years uh, together, you know, um, uh, you know, and a number of other crises that have been gone on around us. We've been through that and we have a depth here. Um, I, I can remember the astonishing nature of the issues in the megachurch. I, I still to this day, uh, one woman wanted help to get her, get her husband off of, of um, opiate drugs. And, uh, and, and she told me about the horror and the nightmare of, of what was happening and the, and the, the, the cravenness of his addiction and, and her use too. And, and I'm like thinking, man, I don't know if, I, if I'm called for this, you know. I start thinking about pay grade quotes and stuff, you know. Uh, and then finally, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, 
I want to talk to him. I want to, I want to see if he really wants out of this world or whatever. And so I'm like, where can I find him? How can I talk to him? He goes, well, he'll be there Sunday. And I'm like, what? He goes, oh, he loves coming Sunday. They turn the lights off and play the music, and he just, he just zones out. He loves it that I like it, and he feels like he's, he's helping our family. And, and I was shocked, and I'm still shocked to this day that that was like, what? How can this be? And, and uh, so, you know, the point is with a small uh, church and group that we have, we're able to, to actually see some of these things more vividly. We're actually, we're actually able to see the ideal here and not hide from the ideal. And we're actually able to even take responsibility for the ideal to a certain extent, but not to the point of, of being one of those dragons. So uh, all that said, uh, Paul says, we're, we're asking that you know your true leaders. In this case, it was Paul, Silas, and Timothy, uh, and to value that super abundantly. There are two words put next to each other. Value, which is a very low key word. Don't overestimate it. Just value it. It's just, it's important that God's able to uh, uh, give John a test that he can't pass so that he knows that he's finite. You know, it's important. It, there's a value in that. Uh, but don't, don't um, stay at that level. So value it super abundantly. Take that, take that limited value and go, I'm, I'm really blessed. I, I can see where God's put this in my life and I really need this. And man, I couldn't have shopped around and got this without uh, this particular arrangement that God has called me to. So, um, and, and to super abundantly value it in agape because of the work that the leaders do. The work of the community of faith is the work of the Lord. It's what the Lord is trying to do. It's everything the Lord is trying to do in this time. And, and to value that and say, I want the work of the Lord. It's what I need more than anything else in my life. And I am going to, to uh, understand that a community of faith is going to have leaders. I'm going to understand that. I'm not going to resent that, even though I hate leaders everywhere. Uh, I'm not going to resent that. And I'm going to work with that. I'm going to try to to go along with that. And the way to do that is by my heart, I'm going to see their strengths. I'm going to see what it is that they that they are um, uh, leaders because of. And and uh, that's that's what he's asking. And he says that the leaders that you are called to value super abundantly are doing three important things. And those three important things are number one, they are working hard. And and the word uh, kopiantos comes from the Greek word kopiao, which means to labor and work hard diligently and not grow weary. Okay, not grow weary. You know, uh, there is a relentlessness about ministry. There is a, a week in and week out um, a, a view of ministry. And, and you want to do that in dedication to the Lord and, and not fearful. Now, I, I confess to you, there's been times in my I don't know how many ever years, 38 years of ministry I've uh, filled in for for uh, charismatic uh, personality preachers. And there have been times where my motivation to work hard is for fear of failure. <laughs> OK, fear of being uh, exposed as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I can't be speaking to people something I don't really hardly know. and surely the response isn't going to be the same. And so you start grabbing on these little uh, cliches, you know, and they start, they're like, they're like terrorist demons, you know, they're like uh, in Hollywood things, like you're only as good as your last performance, you know, so you're always thinking that, you know, you're always as good, you're only as good as your last performance. But that's not what, that's not how you work hard in ministry. You work hard in ministry by staying at what you know is right, by sticking with what you know is right even though everything around you seems like it's going some other way. Uh, we, had, we had times at Zoe uh, in, in the uh, early teen years that uh, there were people coming in going, Mars Hill is the way to go. You guys need to go this way. Uh, there were people in our community going, this is the future of ministry. This is, this is how things are going to go. And um, uh, 
gosh, I never thought of that. Throw the wallet. It works. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. That was, that was a cheap shot. <laughs> um, okay. So, so grow, growing weary is, is the enemy of working hard in ministry. It's not like doing, not being capable, because God's going to train you. Okay, over time, you're going to learn to, to approach and prepare. You're going to learn the rigors of preparation. Uh, I learned early on from, uh, from the great Chuck Smith Jr. that preparation is the torture chamber of Christian teaching. You prepare and you go into the torture chamber. And you throw all your great ideas around and they hit the wall and they come back howling at you. And uh, you, you, you search for something and there's nothing. You beg for something and there's nothing. You plead for something and nothing responds. And you work through that and you settle in to knowing that this is God's word and it's here. It just hasn't come to me yet. <laughs> and you work hard at it. You know, it's interesting in... Um, in, in John's gospel that we went through last year, uh, there was a point in chapter 4 where uh, Jesus had left Jerusalem. He had left the, uh, the, the first encounters he had with the flipping of tables or whatever. And it says that he must go through uh, Samaria. And that's an interesting phrase in the scripture because he must go through in Samaria is the, lo is the long hard road of the pilgrimage back out to go to Galilee or any other way you'd go along the shore of the seas Sea of Galilee get the Sea of Tiberias and cut in you'd skip Samaria altogether it was level it was a plain uh, you had no mountains to climb and uh, and so uh, and so Jesus must go through Samaria but not because it's the easier route it was the harder route and it tells us in chapter 4, verse 6, that he got to Jacob's well, and it uses the same word. And it says that he was weary of traveling. The road was hard for him. The hot day sunlight in the desert was baking him. He was thirsty. And it says he sat wearily uh, beside the well. And that's all one word. That's, all, that's the word of our text today, to, to, to work hard to the point of you know where you got to go and you're going to go there and you're going to get weary along the way and it's you're going to want to give up and you don't give up and you got to understand if somebody's a true leader in a community of faith at some point they didn't give up they kept at it they stayed with it they kept going when it was time to just stop going and that is the mark of of a, a leader that's able to take on whatever task God has for the community of faith and lead the way, okay? Uh, able to pick up the dog off the Costco parking lot and put him in the car because you got to keep going. You know, you can't stop going. And so that's, that's, the, um, uh, that's the first characteristic. They work hard among you in, in, in bodily and in mental labor, practicing, uh, praying, preparing, getting ready to do ministry with a quality that, be, that belies the, uh, the nature of the ministry, that reveals who the God is we're serving. Uh, if it doesn't cost anything, it's not worth anything. And, and so, uh, so, so that's one reason why you need to be able to appreciate leadership. Now, now secondly, uh, they're set over you in the Lord, literally. They're a gift to you. Now, set over you is not is not the authoritative, uh, it's not the authoritative ranking. It's like the birth order. Okay, okay. You didn't choose to be an older sister, or an older brother. You didn't choose to be a younger brother, younger sister. But you are because somebody else determined that. The giver of life determined that. And so what what Paul is telling the Thessalonians: Look, you got uh, you got me, and you got Silas, and you got Timothy. And one of, a, one of us, you might not like us. You might go, ah, that Timothy, man, he just tags along with Paul. Paul's the lion doing all the work, and Timothy's just the measly mouse. Uh, you, might be, you might be thinking disparaging things. And, uh, and, and, and Paul's saying, we've been appointed over you. We brought the gospel here. And look at what happened with Timothy. He ended up being the chief spokesperson to bring the news back to the Thessalonians and then come back to Paul and, 
in Athens and Corinth and give him the news, you know, that, that they were receiving the gospel. And they just didn't know the, appointed, uh, the appointment that Timothy had. But, but Timothy was appointed uh, over them. And, and so, so understand that people can rise to ministry by ambition. And this is probably the case with Mark Driscoll. You, you catch the ambition. Now, I was in one of his sessions in the, in the late 90s, early aughts, uh, at the Emergent Conference. And the guy was so ambitious. He was screaming and yelling at all the attendees in the conference, arguing with everybody he could. He was contentious. Uh, he was challenging. He was, he was ambitious, and he was proud of it. And you can go a long way, uh, even in, in, uh, in social structures, but even in the church, you can go a long way through ambition and rising and pushing other people out of the way and, and being an opportunist. Those aren't true leaders. A true leader is called and, and appointed by God, called by God, and maybe doesn't even uh, fully understand, Lord, why are you calling me? And in fact, if, if I understand Scripture right, most of you who understand the Scripture are going to be put in a position one day where you serve more. <laughs> and right now you're thinking, man, I, I got my hands full just trying to understand this thing, Christianity, just trying to be faithful. And then one day the Lord comes along and says, you, you're going to stand up and pray today. You, you're going to stand up and teach today. You, you're going to grab a guitar and sing. <gasps> oh my gosh, that would be, that can't happen. <laughs> so, so remember that that for leadership that's authentic, it's been appointed. And, and that's God's way. He goes from generation to generation. He hands down the ministry from generation to generation. And there's an advantage to having seen it before. There's an advantage to having gone through things before. There's an advantage you get because your older brother grew up and, and went to school and fought bullies. There, there's an advantage to some things that happen because of the way God does things. And understand that, and it'll help you appreciate better leadership when, you, when you're you feeling like, I don't really want to focus on the thing they want me to focus on, or I don't really want to follow that person the way they're going. Uh, you know, um, you, you have to understand that God appointed them. And then the third thing is they warn you. <laughs> now, this is the one I want you to really put on your thinking caps, put on your Australian shepherd dog hat. And I want you to think about this for a second. Leaders warn you, but they don't warn you sometimes directly. In fact, most of the times they don't warn you directly. They warn you because you're listening to them and you're appreciating what they have to say. You're learning and hearing what they're going to say. And that needs to be a warning to you. That's the nature of public ministry. Public ministry comes at you in a public way. It doesn't address you particularly. And then you listen to it and you go, boy, that's me. I'm not going to look around a lot right now, but that's me. And I'm going to take this to heart. I'm going to take the warning from this. And, uh, and, and that's the way God wants to do it because he's gentle and he's kind and he doesn't sit you in the anxious seat like Charles Finney used to do in the great revivals and doesn't question you and press you and make sure your faith is real. God wants you to willingly follow his lead. And so a lot of times uh, he warns you through the ordinary course of things. Repentance is so much a part of Christianity. It's so much a part of growing in the Lord. Being able to say, I was wrong, and not just say, I was wrong, oh, thank you, thank you, I'm covered by the blood of Christ, but I was wrong, and I'm not going to be wrong in that area again. I'm turning away from that wrong. That's what true repentance is. And it's so vital to your growing and becoming the new person God wants you to be that you've got to be warned about things. And you've got to have a heart of saying, Lord, if I'm off base here, warn me. Let me see. Let me know where, where I should go next. And, and, and it's so basic a part of, of, um, you know, of, of Christianity that you have to be listening for warning. Now, here's the blessing. He's saying, let the leaders in the community of faith be ones who admonish you or warn you. Let them be, that, let them be in that role. And you know you benefit from that. Because most of the time they know what they're talking about. You know, there's this big thing down south where somebody said, hey, if you get this horse dewormer and you take it for COVID, the COVID will go away. OK, so now the FDA is, is telling people in the south, do not take uh, medication meant for animals or horses to deworm them for COVID. 
Go get the free medicine at the hospital. Do not take this other medicine. Like how, how resistant have you become to, to common sense and truth that you will go and take horse tranquilizer to cure COVID? It, and so the, the point is here that, that people have listened to somebody warn them who shouldn't be warning them about their health, shouldn't be telling them how to deal with COVID. And so too, uh, you know, when, when you're in a community of faith that doesn't have a, a man-made agenda, the warnings come through the scripture and come through the human life of the people who are, who are leading the way. And by leading, uh, they're not standing in front of people necessarily, but, but they are moving forward in their faith. They are leading the way so that you can go in that, in that way also. Uh, and, you know, we've had some things in Thessalonians that have been pretty radical, you know. I've told you don't, don't lay in bed at night and, and think about nothing. Lay in bed at night and let the light of the Lord come into your soul. Don't let that darkness period uh, lead you off into sleep even. Don't sleep. Pray. Seek the Lord. Face your fears in faith. Think about the opportunities you have for love, agape. Let the hope of salvation strengthen your resolve in you. Don't let the enemy prowl around you in the darkness of your life and seek to, to stomp you out. Those are things that I'm trying to lead us in a way that, that's according to Scripture that will, that will do for us what it did for the Thessalonians. They were able to live in Macedonia and don't ever underestimate the closeness and the exemption that the Thessalonians had to the Roman rules. They were privileged. They were favored by the Roman Empire. And, and yet Paul could say, you know, the, you got to... You got to be really careful. Even at night, you got to be praying. You got to be thinking of the light because the darkness is all around. And the darkness will close in on you. Okay, so um, that is, th- or those are the three things that uh, that that are fundamental to you being able to receive what you need to receive from leadership. That is, you need to be able to follow leadership. But but in his in his uh, text, Paul is just saying, just respect them. Just give them the honor that's due and listen to them and understand where they're coming from. That's all he's setting up. Don't worship them. Don't idolize them. You're not signing up for an army here. You're not militarily bound to obey their rules, but understand where they're coming from and follow them. They work hard among you. The Lord put them in a place to to be speaking and to be publicly uh, admonishing you and and they warn you okay and they don't warn you through fear they're not out there yelling the commies are coming the commies are coming they're saying the night is coming the night is coming and it's going to be dark so now the, let the darkness that's in you be light and, uh, and and get used to that right now okay so the result is again we already covered the result you can make peace with with everybody in the, in the community of faith. There's no need for you to be right and them to be wrong. There's no need for there to be differences because the leaders are called to be the leaders and they're the leaders. And so just give them the respect that's needed, Paul's saying, and, and everything's gonna be fine. And then you don't, you don't have a need to strive against one another, to have ambition. Uh, to, to say, well, I want the title of uh, deacon, elder. I want to be the worship leader. I want to do this. I want to be the leader. You don't have to do that because, you know, God may or may not appoint you. And when he does appoint you, you're going to go, uh-oh, why did he appoint me? I'm not ready yet. Uh, you're going to be a, a little bit caught off guard anyway. So why strive for that? Why make problems with somebody else? Why knock somebody else down uh, to get what you don't really want? When you get there, you won't really want it. Okay. So in verse 14, Paul calls them forward. There, there are things that can be happening in their midst. And I want to, again, warn you, these are not ideals. They're not to be taken as ideals. You're not to look around and go, well, that church doesn't have it. That church doesn't have it. We barely have it. We have some of it. We don't have all of it. Or think of incidents of, oh, this, this is clearly wrong. This is more like um, a gauge than an ideal, okay? Uh, when I'm traveling, I, I look at my temperature gauges and my charging gauges in my van. I know when the uh, alternator, I know when the systems are working right because the charge gets to a certain level and stays there. 
the temperature gets to a certain level and stays there. Uh, I know that if I'm climbing a mountain, I better see the temperature go up or the cooling system's not working right uh, and, uh, and something's really wrong. So I use the gauges to say, this thing's running right. It's running on all cylinders, it's running smooth. And that's kind of what this is like. So there's gonna be four things and they can be happening. And if you don't see them happening at all, uh, then realize that, uh, you know, maybe we're too far from the ideal, maybe we'll head to the ideal, or maybe you're going to take up all four things <laughs> and uh, you're going to carry the torch for a while, maybe. I don't know. I'm just uh, tongue in cheek with you now. So the first thing is warning the insubordinate. And the first thing is probably the most problematic, okay? Warning. So the leaders are giving the warnings. Okay, uh, like I'm telling you, night is not night anymore. Night needs to be daylight for you. If you're going to treat night as night, you're taking the night off. And you don't want to be taking too many nights off. Okay, uh, you want to be having daylight in your soul as much as you can, as much as you can take those moments of, of darkness and, and bring the light of the gospel into your heart and be a, be a person of the light even at night. That's a, that's a warning. That's a exhortation. Okay, now... There, is a, there are people in any community of faith who, who are called the insubordinate by this word. Um, other, other translations of the word besides insubordinate are the unruly. Um, uh, now, it's an interesting uh, profile and word study because it's not only unruly, but it's also uh, the people who get overly excited about the wrong things, uh, who because the excitement is just a, a masquerade of, oh, I'm excited for the Lord, and I'm really excited that the stock market's going to go up tomorrow, and, and uh, I can help you with your day trading, or whatever. They're, they're off base. They're excited about stuff, but, it, but it's not the, what, what's supposed to be in tune with what the excitement is about. Uh, unruly, insubordinate. The Spirit makes known or manifest objection, you know, uh, the service is over and somebody's at the at the coffee cup next to you and they're going, yeah, you know, I, he was really off base with that. I I heard this guy uh, I heard this guy in in uh, 1999, Chuck Missler, and he said the Lord's coming back in in uh, 2021, and uh, I think he's coming back tomorrow. And 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 you know that right there, that person is uh, insubordinate in the sense that what the warning was in public to everyone that person is just it just lost it he's just like well I, that's not that leader doesn't know what they're talking about or whatever okay so at this point now you're there and 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 you're with maybe yourself or a group of people so the effective and and uh and the right thing that should happen is somebody ought to say i don't know i think i'm going to go with what was taught this morning because I, I really think that was of the lord and um uh, so, um, so do you see how it works that you, you exhort the, uh, un, you exhort the unruly. Uh, if someone is saying, you know, he told us to go out and get vaccinated, but you know what? I, I heard this, um, and, 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 and then I got COVID and, and my friend said, take this horse stuff. And, and, and he said, it really works. It really helps them. Uh, you know, may that person just keep that to themselves or go out. I mean, somebody's on record of saying, hey, I vouch for this treatment. It's, uh, it's, it's okay for you to get vaccinated. <laughs> um, I, I'm vouching for this, okay? If, if this is not of the Lord, you stand in heaven. You go, John told me to do that, doggone it. And I'll stand up for that. I'm pretty convinced this is God's grace to us. Um, so, so the point is, is you back what's going on that's right. That has to happen because everything that comes in by the way of leadership will be destroyed by the unruly. They will just destroy it. They'll just tear it down. They'll just send it away. You know, this is this is perpetually the problem of the interface between Pentecostalism and the third wave of the charismatic movement. They were very similar uh, in their views of, of ministry, but whenever... Uh, the, the third wave of the spirit would move, the Pentecostals would be there and they'd just take the movement over. And they would just say, well, we got language for that. This is the second blessing, brother. You come back to this prayer room here, we're gonna lay hands on you, you're gonna get the second blessing. And uh, you're gonna be baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
and, and someone was just impressed that God healed somebody, and now they're signed up for this hundred-year-old movement that's got, a, that's got its own world of problems and wasn't even being taught there in that church. And, it, and it's a sabotage. It's a takeover. It's a stealing away. And, you know, Dave and I talked about this on one of the Dave's podcasts that we're entering into an era where evangelicalism, the old guard evangelicalism, is just waiting to recapture its turf. People that realized, hey, this is these people have gone off the deep end. These uh, people have run off the cliff and they're now at the bottom of the Sea of the Gadarenes. They're not going to feel like that. They're going to, we're still on top of the world. We got our, we got the system. We got the ways. We got the organization. And so when the Lord starts to work and starts to revive and, and renew people in smaller groups and smaller contexts, those those clutches are going to be at all of the converts. They're going to be right there. We've got, we've got programs. We've got resources. We've got materials. Well, they're not going to tell you that after 40 years of using them, it screwed everybody up and everybody's head's all messed up because of it. They're not going to tell you that part. They're just going to go, we're, we're ready for the revival. We're ready to make this happen again. And so it's it's got to be backed. The legitimacy of what God's doing in a small group or in a big group has got to be backed by the people that know it's right, that, that are connected with it and involved with it. So um, uh, real quickly here, uh, because um, we're, we're out of time for this morning, but I'm not supposed to say that because that makes your mind check out. We have, we have three other very important things to do here. But, but secondly, uh, along with exhorting uh, the unruly, is comforting the faint-hearted. And this is another function that you can take the responsibility of if you do this right. Okay, I want you to think about the word faint-hearted. Because somebody can hear from God and be called by God, be one of the chosen, be responding to God, set out on a course, and somewhere along that line, in the course of things, their heart just faints. It's it's too hard. They hit a discouragement. They hit something that just stops them in their track. They're, they're just unable to go forward. It doesn't invalidate the path they were on, but they are not going to be able to go forward. And you, who are their friend, who knew of the great things the Lord was doing, who saw the work of the Lord, can come up alongside them. And this word for encourage is, is a very picturesque word. It has the word para, which which is um, to come up alongside, but it also has the word of calculate, to recalculate with them. When people are faint-hearted, they start calculating, well, maybe I shouldn't have done this, and maybe I shouldn't have done that, and maybe that was such a mistake, and maybe this was such a mistake. You can come up alongside that person if you know the work of the Lord in their life enough, and you could tell them, no, that's not what's happening to you right now. What's happening to you right now is not that you were off track, What's happening to you right now is, you, is this, this particular thing discouraged you and made your heart faint. And now let's get through that so you can get back on that path again with your heart strong. This is at night when you're facing something and you're, and you're feeling like you need faith. You got to believe in the Lord because you can't face at night what you, you're facing. And you face it in the light by having trust in the Lord. Well, the Lord's going to be there. And uh, I believe that when Lisa was singing the song and the verse of take my hand now and singing it of Jesus take my hand now, that there's somebody here that needs to take Jesus' hand. Be that person. Don't be afraid to be that person because if you don't take it, I'm taking it. And, and, and take my hand and just go through something together. That's what this is. Do this for each other. This is the ministry. We would call this in the systematic days, body ministry, okay? Uh, that's just a, a, a term that probably uh, lowers the, uh, the, the sacredness of it all. But, but the idea that in a, in a world in which the community of faith goes forward and grows, encouraging the faint-hearted is very much a part of a small group. So I'm going to uh, save us all the, the, uh, the, the prolonging of time. I'm going to stop right there. The, I only covered two of the four things that are a part of your responsibility and duty if you want to take them on. They can be a gauge for, for health in the community of faith. They are not an ideal. 
They are their inclinations. They are things that if you do that, you'll find the Holy Spirit there going, yeah, I got one, got one to help, <laughs> and, uh, and he'll be helping you, and uh, you'll be able to do that uh, straightforward. So I'm not sure how to conclude this except to say that we want to uh, really understand Paul's acceptance of the Thessalonians as a chosen people. The gospel has come in and taken root, and in order to go forward, there's going to have to be different types and levels of togetherness that are, that are ingrained. They're homegrown. The leaders are homegrown. And, and those leaders have to be appointed and respected, and they have to be exhorting and helping warn every one of the dangers ahead. And then that has to be picked up by the people who were warned and realize it's legit. And they have to stand firm in that, in that exhortation. And then we have to watch out for, for uh, uh, various people who are weaker, who have been hurt, who are sick, which we're going to get to next time. And when that falls upon all of us to do that. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you for our time in the Word today. Uh, I know it's kind of a cerebral, maybe a uh, pedantic type of exercise to go through this. But I, I just see over the years, this is where the power of the ministry is at. This is where people have found the Spirit of God and His work and even confused it and made systems of thought and taken shows on the road and gone on with it. But this is where we want to, we want to know it's, it's areas of growth that are possible, that are blessed by God, that are things that God wants to do. And I pray that we could take this to heart and learn our lessons from it. In Jesus' name, amen. So may the Lord bless you this week. May he always put over you leaders who are appointed by him, who work very hard, and who are able to warn you in ways that, are, that you're able to receive and respond to. May repentance and renewal of life continue to always be a part of your faith. And may you also be watchful for those who are unruly and who are just trying to divide. And please, please bless the faint-hearted with confidence and encouragement. God bless you this week in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.